Good morning, brothers and sisters. Welcome back to church. Yes, can I invite all of us to please stand as we stand in the midst of our Lord. Um, let me read to all of us Psalm 100 to remind all of us why we are called to be here this morning. Psalm 100. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into His presence with singing. Know that the Lord, He is God. It is He who made us, and we are His. We are His people and the sheep of His pasture. Enter His gates with thanksgiving and His courts with praise. Give thanks to Him. Pray, bless His name. For the Lord is good, His steadfast love endures forever, and His faithfulness to all generations. It is indeed a good reminder for all of us that we are God's creation. We are His. We are His sheep, that He provides the pastures for us. And as we come into His presence this morning, can I invite all of us to surrender ourselves, our thoughts, our worries, anxieties, all unto Him and trust in Him. Trust that He will make a way for us because He is our God. Trust in His unfailing love for us. Trust in His faithfulness that He will carry us through no matter the situation. Hello, Father, we want to thank you for gathering us this morning. We thank you, Lord, for once again reminding us in your word that, Lord, you are our God, you are our creator. And, Lord, we come before you. We want to bless you. We want to thank you. And we pray, Father, Lord, that uh, may you be pleased, Lord, even as we come before you, surrendering ourselves totally unto you, Lord. Whatever worries, anxieties, or Whatever the distractions that the evil one tries to pull us away from you, we pray, Father, Lord, that you will keep us in your presence. Keep our hearts, our mind focused on you. That we may totally, Lord, surrender ourselves to you in worship, in praise and in thanksgiving. We thank you, Father, Lord, for those who are on the way here, Lord, we pray that you grant them journey mercy and bring them, Lord, into your presence too. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Brothers and sisters, the Lord be with you. Together, Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ said, The first commandment is this, The Lord our God is the only Lord. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, Love your neighbour as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than this. Amen. Lord, have mercy upon us and write all these laws in our hearts. God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, Jesus Christ, to save us from our sins and to be our advocate in heaven and to bring us to eternal life. Therefore, brothers and sisters, let us confess our sins in penitence and faith firmly resolve to keep God's commandments and to live in love and peace with all men. Can I invite all of us to please sit all new if we are able to? Let's allow the Spirit of God to move among us and to help us to bring to mind the week that's passed, that has passed and also to bring to mind if anything that we have displeased our Lord, that we may come in confession to Him.
brothers and sisters, let us say the confession prayer together. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our fellow men in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in newness of life. To the glory of your name. Amen. Receive now the absolution. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in life eternal through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I'd like now to invite the worship team to lead us in a time of praise and worship. Church, are we ready to praise the Lord this morning? For indeed, the Lord is good and His love endures forever. Amen. Can I invite all of us to clap along as we sing um, that Jesus, you are so good. Jesus, you are so good. Jesus, you are so good. There's nothing to fear, cause I'm here in your presence. Jesus, you are so good. Jesus, you are so, so good. I just want to thank you with every beat of my heart. You have given eternal life, and your words to light my way. Given me your spirit with your mercies every day. Jesus, you are so good. Jesus, you are so good. There's nothing to fear, cause I'm here in your presence. Jesus, you are so good. Jesus, you are so, so good. I just want to thank you. Confidence and my soul is filled with peace, for you are my provider, you supply my every need. Jesus, you are so good, Jesus, you are so good. There's nothing to fear, cause I'm here in your presence. Jesus, you are so good. So, so good. I just want to thank you with every beat of my heart. I just want to thank you, Lord. I just want to thank you with every beat of my heart. I just want to thank you, Lord. I just want to thank you with every beat of my heart. Indeed, Lord, we want to give you thanks. We want to give you praise, Father Lord, for being here with us all the way, Father Lord. Lord, we pray that as we go about our daily lives, Lord, we pray that as we go through the deepest pits in our life, Father Lord, that remember, Lord, that you are always here for us, Lord, that there is nothing too big for you. And we stand on the promise that whatever we go through, Father Lord, that you will rescue us, Lord. My Jesus, my Savior, Lord, there is nothing See you. 
me close to you. Never let me go. Lay it all down again. To hear you say that I'm your friend. Nothing else could take your place To feel the warmth of your embrace Help me find a way To bring me back to you You're all Say 
You Lord, truly indeed, Lord, you have promised that those who come to you, you will save them, Lord. And those who stay to the end will be safe. We thank you for your blessing, thank you for your promise, and thank you, Lord, that you have made it possible for us through your spirit. That you convict hearts that they may come and surrender to you. So we pray and ask, Lord, that you will convict us, Lord, with your word and help us with your strength to come to you with your wisdom and with your conviction that we have this hope in you through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Brothers and sisters, please, please be seated for the scripture reading. The first reading is taken from Romans chapter 11, verses 1 to 2 and 29 to 32. Romans 11, verse 1. I ask then, has God rejected his people? By no means, for I myself am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Do you not know what the scripture says of Elijah, how he appeals to God against Israel? For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. For just as you were at one time disobedient to God, but now have received mercy because of their disobedience. 
so they do too. They too have now been disobedient in order that by the mercy shown to you, they also may now receive mercy. For God has consigned all to disobedience that he may have mercy on all. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The second scripture reading for today is taken from Psalms chapter 31, verses 1 to 24. Psalms chapter 31, verse 1. In you, O Lord, do I take refuge. Let me never be put to shame. In your righteousness, deliver me. Incline your ear to me, rescue me speedily. Be a rock of refuge for me, a strong fortress to save me. For you are my rock and my fortress, and for your name's sake you lead me and guide me. You take me out of the net they have hidden for me, for you are my refuge. Into your hand I commit my spirit. You have redeemed me, O Lord, faithful God. I hate those who pay regard to worthless idols, but I trust in the Lord. I rejoice and be glad in your steadfast love, because you have seen my affliction. You have known the distress of my soul, and you have not delivered me into the hand of the enemy. You have set my feet in a broad place. Be gracious to me, O Lord, for I am in distress. My eye is wasted from grief, my soul and my body also. For my life is spent with sorrow, and my ears with sighing. My strength fails because of my iniquity, and my bones waste away. Because of all my adversaries, I become a reproach, especially to my neighbours, and an object of dread to my acquaintances. Those who see me in the street flee from me. I have been forgotten like one who is dead. I become like a broken vessel, for I hear the whispering of many, terror on every side, as they scheme together against me, as they plot to take my life. But I trust in you, O Lord. I say, you are my God. My times are in your hand. Rescue me from the hand of my enemies and from my persecutors. Make your face shine on your servant. Save me in your steadfast love. O Lord, let me not be put to shame. For I call upon you, let the wicked be put to shame. Let them go silently to show. Let the lying lips be mute. We speak insolently against the righteous in pride and contempt. Oh, how abundant is your goodness, which have stored up for those who fear you and worked for those who take refuge in you, in the sight of the children of mankind. In the cover of your presence, you hide them from the plots of men. You store them in your shelter from the strife of tongues. Blessed be the Lord, for he has wondrously shown his steadfast love to me when I was in a besieged city. I sit in my alarm. I am cut off from your sight, but you heard the voice of my pleas for mercy when I cried to you for help. Love the Lord, all you his saints. The Lord preserves the faithful, but abundantly repays the one who acts in pride. Be strong and let your heart take courage, all you who wait for the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we come before your word this morning, enable our hearts to hear your voice, be strengthened and be encouraged, Lord, to wait for you and to depend on you in our time of need. Speak to us and help us to hear and help us to heed your word to us. In Jesus' name, Amen. Who can you trust? When it comes to the matter of trust, uh, this is a, a very much sought-after commodity uh, nowadays, isn't it? Ever, ever wondered why they name one of the credit cards the trust card? Uh, some of you can see the colours there, right? <laughs> Perhaps it is to convey the notion that that uh, particular card or that mode of payment is reliable, is dependable and widely accepted, yeah? And I'm not advertising or endorsing it, but they do give pretty good rebates. Huh? <laughs> now, when we are not well, when we are unwell, who do we turn to for trustworthy diagnosis and treatment? Well, I think most of us would turn to our trusted uh, doctors, physicians or, or specialists. And if we have a dental problem, 
As much as we may not like to see the dentist, you would nonetheless go uh, to see your trusted dentist or, or dental clinic before the situation worsens. Am I right? Am I right? Yeah. By and large, for those who have lived long enough, trust is rather lacking because we live in a world where what we rely on do fail us. Systems fail us, people fail us, even friends can fail us, sometimes through no fault of their own. And institutions also do fail. And throughout human history, we see kings and governments have failed. Rulers and authorities have failed. And in fact, uh, recently in the West African state of Niger, there was a coup. And again, uh, you see all these uh, chaotic uh, situations in different parts of the world. And we know also throughout history, empires have risen and fallen. Even some of the things that uh, some of us uh, may have been taught in school as fact are being proven now to be rather inconclusive at best and possibly false at worst. Take, for instance, some of the long-held scientific postulations regarding the origins of the universe. How many of you listened to Michio Kaku, Andre de Grasse Tyson, and so on? Okay, a few hands up. Very good. So I, at least I don't feel so lonely. Eh? <laughs> now, again, uh, you know, the understanding of the origins of the universe, uh, th these things are now being called into question because of recent observations being made in, uh, that are being made into deep space by, you know, the James Webb uh, Space Telescope, and now recently the Euclid Space Telescope as well. Those of you who are into such things. And this uh, had gotten the attention of prominent scientists and astrophysicists who are now very, very busy trying to come up with new explanations. And some are even now saying that the universe existed before the Big Bang or that it has stopped expanding altogether. Uh, people like Brian Cox uh, from the UK, a British physicist, uh, you know, continue to, to explain things like that in, in that regard. And, of course, all these explanations can fascinate us, uh, you know, and, and captivate us in, in, to some degree. Perhaps, uh, given my physics background, I'm a bit curious about such things. But can their understanding and interpretation be fully trusted? Or are they, at best, good guesswork? After all, the physical universe is extremely vast, the visible universe as well, to say the least. And there are obvious limitations to the instruments that are being employed to make the observations and through which they have formulated their views. I mean, all that they can see is just a very tiny little sliver of a window <laughs> of the whole universe, okay? Now, coming back more down to earth, can you trust the messages that you receive on your mobile phones? Can you trust what is passed around as news through social media platforms and so on? So what are the trusted sources of information that we usually turn to for reference or for help. Are these trustworthy anymore? So where should we place our trust? Who can we trust? Romans 10 verse 11 says that everyone who believes in Him that is in Christ will not be put to shame. And certainly what the Scripture tells us is that when we have put our trust in the Lord, we will not be put to shame. And this echoes very much what is said in Psalm 31 verse 1, where the psalmist says, In you, O Lord, do I take refuge. Let me never be put to shame. The inspiration behind uh, Luther's hymn, uh, A Mighty Fortress is Our God, actually apparently uh, was derived from Psalm 31 as well. The psalm we're looking at today is Psalm 31. And this is one of the lament psalms of David. What is significant of this psalm is that a particular verse was quoted by our Lord at a most poignant moment. And this was when Jesus was on the cross. In fact, uh, Jesus uh, said in verse 5, when he was about to breathe his last, into your hand I commit my spirit. And these were certainly not the words of uh, someone in despair, someone who feels abandoned or laden with self-doubt or self-pity. In fact, it is so, it's so impressed the centurion who witnessed the event, so much so that he praised God saying, this, certainly this man was innocent. Now, the centurion obviously has seen quite a number of crucifixions, right? And so this person that is here is very different from all the others. Let us now take a closer look at this psalm and see what it may have to teach us about trusting God in times of trial and 
distress. Well, the psalm begins with a statement of trust. Verse 1 to 2. In you, O Lord, do I take refuge. Let me never be put to shame. In your righteousness, deliver me. Incline your ear to me, rescue me speedily. Be a rock of refuge for me, a strong fortress to save me. You know, there's a bit of speculation as to when this psalm was written. Some say when uh, David was fleeing King Saul. Others say, uh, scholars say that it's uh, when he was uh, fleeing Absalom, his son, who was out to kill him. Either case, both were out to kill him. Yeah. In time of need or trouble, the psalmist knew that he could turn, first of all, to the Lord for help. The Lord will protect him. The Lord will deliver him. He could count on the Lord to not let him down. Situation was urgent, and so he called on the Lord to rescue him speedily. Obviously, the enemy, again, is not some weak enemy, but a powerful one. Because from him saying that when he called on the Lord to be his refuge and strong fortress, it would suggest that the enemy was not some ordinary enemy. It was a very powerful enemy. In verse 3 to 8, the psalmist recounts how he had experienced God as a strong and mighty deliverer. So in time of trouble, he remembered the occasions when God had actually delivered him, God had actually protected him. Yeah? It's, it's good. In verse 3 to 4, he called on the Lord to deliver him for his name's sake. Now this is a rather interesting way to pray. <laughs> I'm your child, save me, huh? You know, but in this case, for your name's sake, please save me. You know, it's a very different dynamic here. The Lord, as it were, had a reputation to keep. David had testified that the Lord was not only his rock and fortress, meaning his security and protector, but also his leader and guide. And so his plea for God's deliverance and rescue in verse 1 and 2 was based on this, on this uh, premise that God has a reputation to keep for your name's sake. And in Psalm 23, we know that He leads me in paths of righteousness for His name's sake, isn't it? Isn't that wonderful? Yeah? So it's not dependent on, on, on you. It's dependent on who God is, you see. That's a very powerful prayer to pray. Eh? And so now He called on the Lord to take him out of the net that the enemy had ensnared him with. Right, And in the light of who the Lord is, the psalmist is able to place himself fully into the Lord's hands when he said, Into your hand I commit my spirit. You have redeemed me, O Lord, faithful God. Lord, you are faithful. You are trustworthy. You are dependable. And I commit myself, my life to you. And he was able to trust the Lord with his life because the Lord was faithful to rescue him and redeemed him, redeem him. Verse 6 to 7 speaks of the psalmist's loyal trust in the Lord. In affliction and distress, his faith did not turn elsewhere, he said. If you take, take a look at the commandments, the uh, first one says, I am the Lord your God. You shall have no other gods but me. So you see here, David basically saying, I'm not turning to idols. <laughs> I'm putting my trust in you. He trusted in the Lord, his faith did not go elsewhere. It remained in God's steadfast love and care uh, for him. Loyalty being the first law of God, in the sense, loyalty to God. In verse 8, we see here reflected the psalmist's own confident hope in the Lord who will not abandon him, but will enable him to stand firm and secure. So David did not rely on his own cleverness, his own devices, his own resources. He relied on the Lord to enable him to stand and to stand strong and secure. Now, in the circumstance that, that the psalmist was in, that David was in, you know, one would have thought that maybe, oh, let's, let's uh, do some positive thinking here. Let's speak positively. Let's not talk negatively and all that. And uh, basically to just uh, try to numb whatever you know, sense that we may have about the terrible situation or distress that we are in. But David didn't do any of that. There was no denial of the dire circumstances that he was in. Verse 9 to 13 tells us that. 
He was in distress, and he said so. He was in grief. He was in sorrow, and he was sighing. You know, when you're sad, you, you, you sigh, right? I mean, <laughs> you don't have to say it, you sigh, right? And verse 9 to 10, because why? Because of the adversaries. Verse 11, who were plotting to take his life. Verse 10. Now, there's something interesting about verse 10 which I'd like to draw your attention to as well. And there was mention here, David was talking about his own iniquity. And so, therefore, the understanding of the distress that he was, he was experiencing was uh, understood as part of God's chastisement for him. Interesting, isn't it? So he framed it within that understanding that because of this wrongdoing or, or the things that he had you know, done wrongly, now he's, he's receiving the, the, the so-called the chastisement from the Lord. Yeah? But it's a chastisement not unto destruction, but it's for correction, which uh, will eventuate in restoration. And if so, the purposes of God and not of the enemies of the evildoers will ultimately prevail. Isn't that wonderful? So God does use sometimes powerful foes to chastise us. Like what God did with Israel when he sent them into Babylonian exile. And after that period of chastisement of 40 years in exile, the Lord brought them back to the land to restore them. You can read all about that in Jeremiah and so on. Yeah? In verses 14 to 18, the psalmist acknowledged that his times are in God's hand. Now, this is actually a, a marvellous uh, expression of trust. In a sense that you know that if it is time for you to go, uh, your time I, uh, is in God's hand. If it's time for you, uh, not for you to go, then nothing is going to happen that will be able to take you. What a wonderful freedom and liberty, isn't it? Yeah? And so, he expressed his steadfast trust in the Lord in the midst of his present distress. Such a trust was not only based on his own past experience of God's deliverance, which we read in verse 3 to 8, but more significantly, on the promises of God's covenant. Now, this is a very key point. Verse 16 actually reflects that he remembered God's covenant with him, where he said, Make your face shine on your servant. Save me in your steadfast love. Now, verse 16 is actually... Uh, you can say a, a throwback uh, uh, to, to number 6, verse 23 to 27, where this uh, blessing that God gave uh, uh, to Aaron to bless Israel with, thus you shall bless the people of Israel. You shall say to them, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you shalom, peace. So shall they put my name upon the people of Israel, and I will bless them. This is God's covenantal blessing, God's covenantal relationship with his people. And David recounted, recalled that, remembered that, and he called on that. In verse 18, we see juxtaposed the wicked and the righteous. Those who spoke and acted in pride and contempt against the righteous will eventually be silenced before the Lord. That was the confidence that David had. The psalm, of course, concludes uh, verses 19 to 24. The psalmist once again recounted the Lord's protection and deliverance, firstly. Secondly, and, and of course, he expressed renewed confidence in the Lord who will keep him safe. So that was his, his, uh, one of the points that he draws on. Uh, secondly, uh, he, he, in the concluding, ver concluding verses of this psalm, in verses 23 to 24, the psalmist called on God's faithful ones to love the Lord and to remain humble and faithful to Him. They should remain strong and courageous, thirdly, and to wait patiently for the Lord to deliver. Now, this point about waiting patiently is not something <laughs> which uh, many of us find easy to do. Huh? When we see a situation, we want to deal with it, we want to sort things out and resolve it, you know? and, and uh, uh, well, you know, rely on our set own strength or whatever. But the psalmist here relied on the Lord. And instead of taking matters into his own hands, he trusted the Lord to, and he, he called on God's people to remain strong and courageous and to wait 
patiently for the Lord to deliver. Now, when and how this deliverance will take place is not mentioned or sought. All that he prayed for was, <laughs> rescue me speedily. <laughs> but he didn't say tomorrow or next week or next month or next year or yesterday. <laughs> The timing of God's choosing, the, the manner of God's uh, doing is entirely up to the Lord. You can cry out to Him. You can say, Lord, help me. Please save me. Because if those are, are known, ah, God is going to uh, deliver me tomorrow, no? uh, then faith and trust would not be needed anymore. Would it? So the key lesson of this psalm is that of putting one's trust in the Lord in times of trouble or distress. Trust in the Lord in times of trouble or distress. We all know it's not difficult to keep faith and trust in God when things are going well in good times, when the, you know, the sun is always shining and the skies are blue, the wind is blowing in your favour. Yeah? But it's quite a different thing altogether when things are not going the way that you hope them to go and perhaps your, your world is about to, to come crashing down. And the enemies are at the gates, you know. And uh, what, what do you feel then? What do you do then? Yeah. Well, for the psalmist, what he did was that he turned to the Lord. He recounted, first of all, his experiences of God's deliverance and rescue. And not only that, he remembered who the Lord is. He remembered his relationship with the Lord and the Lord's covenantal promises to him. Amen. Hallelujah. That's what we should do. That is what we should do when we are in trouble, when we are in distress. Remember, first of all, trust in the Lord. Number two, remember the things that He has done for you, for your life. And thirdly, to know your own covenantal relationship with the Lord. Know who He is and know who you are to Him. Amen. When Jesus came into this world, He had a clear mission. He knew what the Father had sent Him to do. And it was to destroy the works of the devil. 1 John 3 verse 8 tells us the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. I like to say that this is not something as an afterthought, eh, written as an afterthought, you know, like a postscript. But this was part and parcel of God's plan and purposes, even before Christ came. Right? And Christ came to enact God's saving plan for fallen sinful humanity. And this will be accomplished through his sacrificial death on the cross. In fact, Hebrews 10 verse 12 to 14 says, But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's the blessing that God has for us, my friends. This, the songs that we sang just now, I mean, they all reflect that, you know. <laughs> we are saved, we are secure. God is so good. Jesus, you're so, so good, right? <laughs> my goodness, where is everybody? <laughs> is Jesus good? He's done all this for us. Once and for all. The debt has been paid. Amen. Our sins are atoned for. <laughs> we are the beloved people of God. Wow, what a blessing. What a blessing. And where do we run? We run to Him. We run into His arms. Don't run away. <laughs> run to Him, right? He's done it. Christ has done it. Now, what that have been, may have been accomplished, let us also not forget that it came at a huge, huge cost. It came at great cost, great suffering, and pain, indescribable pain. And there was no denying of the circumstances. Jesus had to go through Calvary. Jesus had to go through Gethsemane. Jesus had to go through, you know, what they call the Via Dolorosa, you know, that, 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 that journey to the cross. And Jesus had to undergo the ordeal and the pain. Uh, there was the pain of betrayal, the physical beatings, the torture, and the rejection of those whom he had actually come to save, <laughs> to say the least. 
In the midst of all the suffering and pain, our Lord did not lose resolve or focus. Mind you, he had the resources of heaven to call upon at his disposal. If he had felt, he's had enough. Okay, enough. <laughs> Angels come, deal with this Lord. <laughs> he could have done that. But he didn't. Instead, he depended and trusted in his Heavenly Father. His heart was set on doing the Father's will. Famously, when he cried out, Eloi, Eloi, lemme sabachthani, he was not crying out for himself, as some people would like us to believe. As if uh, he was crying out out of self-pity, desperation or despondence. He was crying out vicariously on behalf of fallen sinful humanity as the weight of the sin of the whole world was placed on him. He then became our sacrifice, our sacrificial lamb, so that our sins and that of all who believe in him may be atoned for. He died in order that we may live. He became the sacrifice so that we may be saved. And when this was done, he said, it is finished. In John 19.30, it would have been quite a different thing if he had said, I'm finished. You think about it. He said, it is finished. The sacrifice is complete. The sins are atoned for. It's done. And the Gospel writer, Luke, tells us that Jesus finished in a flourish. Luke 19, 46 says, And Jesus calling out with a loud voice, not with a whimper, not with the last gasp. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. There was authority in that voice. And having said this, he breathed his last Friends, it wasn't the nail, it wasn't the bleeding that killed Jesus. Huh? Jesus laid down his life. This is a very important point because Luke was very careful to point out to us that Jesus called out with a loud voice. If you are really a uh, uh, liao, <laughs> you've got no more strength, huh? you won't be able to say with a loud voice, would you? <sighs> Gasping, you know, right? No, we don't see that. There was strength, there was power, there was authority in his voice. It was not a weak finish, like if a struggle to cross the finishing line, as it were, with one final breath. This actually confirms what Jesus himself said in John chapter 10, verse 17 to 18, where he said, For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life, that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. So let us put away all our, our doubts and, uh, about Jesus. You know, Did he have a weak finish or a strong finish? It's a strong finish, my friends. Friends, how about us? When we undergo trial and suffering for our faith, do we allow the weight of all that we are, we are troubled by and, and distressed by to overwhelm us or overcome us? No. In fact, Romans 8 tells us no. Romans 8 tells us what? This. Can we read this together and say it for ourselves also? Let's do this together, shall we? One, two, three. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. And all the people of God say, Amen. Friends, when we're in trouble, come here. <laughs> Read Romans 8. Okay? And if you feel you're uh, being uh, you know, submerged by the, the, the weight of it all, come here. If you feel the whole thing is uh, overwhelming you, come here. 
we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Interesting, huh? through him who loved us. Huh? It's not dependent on our love for him, you know. It's dependent on his love for us, you know. So we rely on his love for us. Like King David prayed, <laughs> for, because, your, because of your name's sake. <laughs> on you, Lord, help me, <laughs> you know. Amazing, isn't it? What a promise that God has given to all of us as his people. So later on when we sing songs, uh, Jesus is so good or whatever, right? please sing it with uh, real celebration and thanksgiving, you know. Oh, Jesus, you're so, so good. I, I can't, sorry I'm singing in front, but you know, I can't help but sing some, sometimes. It's just so, so good. I'm not convinced. But if you know this as your promise, and your blessing, let us honor the Lord with thanksgiving in our hearts. You know, the Apostle Paul here was not denying the reality of the suffering or death or the struggles or the evil forces that are arrayed against God's people on this side of eternity. He said, I'm convinced. Neither death nor life. The things above or below or present or future can separate me from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. It is in the face and in the midst of all these realities that this statement is made that we are more than conquerors through Christ who loved us. Turn to the person next to you and say, you are more than a conqueror through Christ who loves you. What is your problem? Small problem, lah. You know? Because Christ is oh, more, more powerful, right? Okay? So let us bring that issue, bring that struggle, bring that problem to the Lord and say, Lord, <laughs> please help and help speedily <laughs> and wait, be strong, be courageous and wait patiently. For the Lord. Amen? Friends, we can always turn to God's Word and draw strength and courage from the Lord. We can always turn to God's Word and find comfort and assurance from it. And it is always good to be reminded of who God is and what His promises to us are. It's also good to recount all His wonderful deeds and our experiences of His protection, of His provision, of his intervention and of his deliverance. So as I conclude with the trust card, no. So in conclusion, who can you trust? In good times as well as in bad times, who can you trust? The psalmist placed his trust in the Lord. Our Lord Jesus himself placed his trust in his heavenly Father, also our heavenly Father. What about you? What about us? Who do we trust? Who can we trust? Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your reminder from the word today and to, that calls on us to put our complete trust in you, regardless of whatever circumstance and trouble and distress that we might be in or that we might be faced with. I pray, Father, for those of us in our midst this, this morning who are, are struggling, who are in distress, Lord, you enable him and, or her to, to turn his heart or her heart to you and to know that you are completely trustworthy and that you can be depended upon, Lord, to save, to rescue, to deliver. So, Lord, we ask in your mercy that you will do so speedily. In the meanwhile, that you will... In, Enable us to remain strong and courageous and to wait patiently for your deliverance. So we thank you and praise you, Lord, that we have an advocate with the Father, even Christ Jesus, the righteous one. And Lord, as we, as we submit ourselves uh, afresh and anew to you, enable us, Lord, to Lord, remain steadfast in your love and in your care. In Jesus' name. Amen. Shall we rise with a response song? For indeed, uh, as the message says, um, in whom we can trust. You are 
the Lord in whom I can trust. You are the Lord I can stand upon every step of the way. You take my hand and say, You will always be here right beside me. When I call on you, I know you'll come to me. You are Let us declare our trust in our Lord with the Apostles' Creed. Together, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died and was buried. He ascended to the dead. On the third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of sins, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us say the prayer to collect for 11th Sunday after Trinity. Together. Almighty God, who called your church to witness that you were in Christ reconciling men to yourself, help us so to proclaim the good news of your love, that all who hear it may be reconciled to you, through him who died for us and rose again and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. 
Let's say the prayer seats together. Heavenly Father, you know exactly what I need. You know where I am suffering and hurting. Thank you that you are gentle and kind with me. You want me to approach you and give you all my concerns. So here I am. I need you. I put my complete trust in you. I commit all my burdens to you. I know you are with me and you give me peace and rest in return. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. Brothers and sisters, let us uh, kneel or sit as we continue with the intercession. Father Lord, indeed, we want to thank you for your love and faithfulness through the generations. From the time that the world began to the time that we can enjoy this access with you and, and to you, Lord, uh, by the blood of the new covenant in Christ. We all want to ask of your mercy and grace upon the world. We pray especially for the needy and the countries that are hit by the various crises and disasters, the victims and families who lost loved ones, livelihoods and homes through the floods in China, India, as well as the wildfires in Hawaii. We pray for those affected by the ongoing war in Ukraine and the geopolitical tensions between China and Taiwan. We ask, Lord, for, your, for you to, to turn around these situations. May you enable and empower the believers to intercede unceasingly for these nations, that we will witness a spiritual awakening leading many to faith and salvation. Will you grant your peace and healing upon all nations affected, Lord? We pray too for our country of Singapore. We ask of your divine wisdom upon our government to lead and guide this nation and to seek the common good. Will you help our parliament, Lord, to remain united in their purpose and to uphold good moral values in our society? We also want to commit the upcoming presidential elections into your hands. We pray, Lord, that the people or the person that will be elected, Lord, will be that of your choice. We want to commit the Diocese of Singapore and especially today the Parish of Christ Church into your hands, Lord. With their 2023 team of knowing you and making you known, we pray, Lord, especially for their discipleship program that your spirits will raise up and empower more disciples to the work of discipling others. We thank you, Lord, for the chaplaincy work to the migrant workers through St. Andrew's Migrant Workers Medical Center, that you may continue to be a blessing to the people they reach out to, such as through their lunch outreach initiative. May you, Lord, provide them suitable partners to help to feed the community around the Little India area. Will you bless and strengthen the leadership, Lord, that those who have been entrusted to serve will be sensitive to your leading and accomplish all you have called them to do in faith and in joyful obedience. May your name, Lord, be always magnified and glorified. We want to pray for our own Holy Trinity Church and especially for the Chinese and English ministry leaders gathering today. May you, Lord, continue to lead and inspire us in your love that our people would be able to give our very best to serve you. Help us, Lord, to be persistent in prayer and to strive for excellence in all that we do for your glory. Will you just strengthen and deepen the bonds of love and fellowship amongst our ministry leaders and assistants that they may grow together as a body of Christ and be renewed in your spirit, Lord, uh, to the work of fulfilling the Great Commission in your spirit's power. We want to thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to organise the upcoming mid-autumn outreach event, especially for the committee, Lord, that's planning all the details. May you, Lord, grant wisdom and guidance in the planning and execution process that there will truly be great joy in serving and being the salt and light to the Jalan Basar community. Let us now just spend a moment of quietness and commit the names of those whom we know are suffering in body, mind or spirit in prayer. Father Lord, we want to thank you for the eternal hope that we have in Christ. We want to commit the hands of those, that, or these people with their visible or sometimes even not so visible needs, that they will experience your comfort and healing. Will you grant them courage and hope in their troubles and bring them the joy of your salvation? All these we ask and pray in the name of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Lynn. And uh, 
Is there anyone who is here uh, in our midst? A warm welcome to all who are worshipping with us today. Anyone new in our midst? Okay, all are here. Huh? Okay, we know everybody. Nonetheless, a very warm welcome. A uh, quick number of announcements. Okay, firstly, the uh, Cambodian missions trip that's coming up in November. Uh, training sessions will start on the 10th of September at 1.30 in the conference room. So uh, those of you who have expressed interest to me or that you're interested, uh, just come for this session and, and uh, I'll be able to explain to you what this is all about, okay? And afterwards, at 1.30, the leaders' meet, uh, gathering uh, for our English congregation will take place downstairs at 1.30. So this is uh, for all the ministry leaders, all the Sunday school teachers and, and, and such like, uh, and staff and so on. So please do come at 1.30. Uh, next slide, newcomers lunch, last last call. <laughs> uh, some have already signed up, but in case uh, those of you who haven't, please could you do so, uh, especially uh, those who have been with us for the last year. Uh, although you've become uh, members and so on, uh, this is also for you, and uh, it's an opportunity to get to know other aspects of the church as well. So so uh, uh, don't, don't say, oh, I'm really in the church, but uh, be part of this, and then uh, you get to meet other people as well and an opportunity to ask uh, further questions, okay? Uh, next slide. So we'll be watching now the, the uh, Parish of the Week, Christ Church. Let's do that now. From a small group gathering at St. Peter's Church in 1941, Parish of Christ Church has undergone a wonderful transformation that can only be brought about by our Almighty God. As the first Anglican Indian Church in Singapore, Parish of Christ Church stands at One Dorset Road with the harvest field right at her doorstep. Our founding fathers had a shared vision for the church to be the salt and light to the Indian community in Singapore. To reach out to different language groups Parish of Christ Church started services in Tamil, Punjabi, English and Malayalam. Under the leadership of the late Reverend Canon Samuel Babu, the church launched a private school in 1952 to help students who were affected by World War II. This then led to Christ Church Secondary School, which has relocated to Woodlands. Today, Parish of Christ Church has services conducted in four different languages across six congregations every Sunday. In February 2000, a few brothers started the Indian Friends Tamil Ministry Service with the mission to reach out to Tamil-speaking migrant workers. Through the years, the church has led many migrant brothers to become baptized and confirmed members of Parish of Christ Church. Our Punjabi service is the first North Indian congregation in Singapore. This is a fast-growing congregation with the service being conducted in both Punjabi and Hindi. Our bilingual contemporary service, conducted in both Tamil and English, is modern and charismatic. Parish of Christ Church believes in being a church beyond the walls. We have been reaching out to migrant workers as part of our ministry efforts. The COVID-19 pandemic gave us an opportunity to serve more migrant brothers through chaplaincy support to St Andrew's Migrant Worker Medical Centre. This medical service under St Andrew's Community Hospital provides primary care, dental treatment, physiotherapy and mental well-being counselling for over 85,000 migrant workers each year. As the church continues to grow, Parish of Christ Church strives for every member to be disciple to disciple through the Personal Discipleship Journey Program. Parish of Christ Church has been grouped with Holy Trinity Church, Church of the True Light and Church of the Epiphany under Area Group 6 of the Diocese of Singapore. 
The seven area groups of the diocese enable our parishes to combine resources and support one another in their labour in the Kingdom. Area Group 6 is one of the seven area groups within the Diocese of Singapore. The Diocese is one of the four main denominations of the Protestant churches in Singapore, with a total of 27 local parishes. Praise the Lord. Katharaka Sosaram. Can you all say Katharaka Sosaram? means praise the Lord. <laughs> and, uh, you know, Holy Trinity Church, uh, we actually share a common history with, uh, with the Tamil work. And it all started at St. Peter's Church. It's actually before 1941. Those of you who are curious enough, uh, you, are, you like church history, you know what? We have a baptism register upstairs. It's from 1800s. To 1900s and if you look through the names it includes uh, some of the uh, Tamil brethren who were baptized at St. Peter's Church uh, uh, where we the Fucha and Hokkien congregations came out from okay so we have a shared history it's very very interesting and these are all through the efforts of missionaries uh, uh, doing the work at St. Andrew's Church Mission so you know one of the things that we we must also ask ourselves uh, is is you know God has raised us up and we have, in a sense, inherited such a, a mantle uh, to, to preach the gospel uh, to all communities. Uh, suppose it's not just limited to uh, the island of Singapore, but also beyond. And uh, we all are also very mindful that, you know, every evening, if you happen to be here in the evening, you see that there are quite a number of our migrant workers who actually mingle outside uh, the lane uh, by the side of the church. So I want to encourage us that we would, we would prayerfully look at how maybe the Lord may be wanting to, to use us to, to reach out to them. We may not be able to do it by ourselves <clears throat> with our own language, but certainly we, we can certainly collaborate with uh, uh, members from Christ Church to, in, this, in this endeavor. But more importantly is, is that we, we pray and we see what the mind of the Lord is and then we, we do what God wants us to do. Amen. Next is tithes and offerings in the usual way. And uh, can I invite us all to stand as we share the peace? Before we do that, can we just have a quick look around uh, to those around us whom we are sharing the peace with? Okay. Together we say, We are the body of Christ in the one spirit. We were all baptized in the one body. Let us then pursue all that makes for peace and builds up a common life. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Let's share the peace of Christ one another. Peace be with all of you. Should we prepare ourselves for the offering? Draw me close to you.
receive now the blessing. The peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of His Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Before we depart from here, we forgot to welcome Joash back. <laughs> All right, um, as we depart, let's remember that um, nothing can separate us from the love of Jesus, and indeed, uh, Jesus loves us. Jesus loves us. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones, little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, yes. Thank you.